see you all tonight. This is the Lord's day. It's a wonderful day. It's been a beautiful day. And uh, may the Lord give us just a delightful time together tonight as we look at his word. Um, I'm not sure you are using the New King James here. So yes. somebody help me out. Yes. Uh, somebody help me out. Um, when we come, and let me find a place in my notes. I need to know the word that your translation uses. Uh, in the Romans, I think, chapter 4. I think in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And verse number 3. Verse number 3. What does your New King James say? Does it use the same word as the old King James? So, will somebody read me verse number four? four uh, verse three? Uh, chapter four and verse number three, yes. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believeth God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay, it uses the word counted. Mm -hmm. Counted. Okay. The old King James, accounted. Yeah. Okay, the old King James uses the word imputed, imputed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the New American Standard uses the word accredited. So uh, New King James says accounted or credited, and those two words really are synonyms. Uh, the translator would just have to decide which one he wanted to use because they are totally synonyms. They say the same thing, they mean the same thing, accounted or accredited. So on your notes, um, Notice the title is imputed, imparted, credited, um, or accounted. You can use that word as you have it in your translation. Accounted righteousness. Okay? And uh, so uh, I want to just, if I can, um, we, may, we, we may use something outside of the text of the notes here. But I want you to notice the, the introduction on this. This is a precious passage. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And usually, usually, if you read this, when do you usually hear this text of Scripture used? Anybody here know? This is a text of Scripture that's used commonly, but for what is it commonly used? Commonly used at funerals. It's commonly used at funerals. I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Now, usually they say there are glories in heaven that go beyond and exceed anything we have imagined here on earth. That is true. That is true. However, 1 first, first Corinthians in chapter 1, he's talking about the gospel. Uh, the, the, word, the gospel is to those who perish foolishness. To The message of the preaching of the cross is to those who perish foolishness. To us, it's the power of God. And he's talking about the message of the gospel, the wisdom of God, which is revealed in the gospel. And so when he comes to chapter 2, he says, you need to understand that this salvation that we take for granted to an unbeliever is not only foreign, they're incapable of even beginning to conceive of the greatness and the wonderful provisions. In fact, most believers don't have a grasp on the wonders of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. So we speak God's wisdom, and I'm reading now 1 Corinthians 2, 7, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. Anybody know what a mystery is? Well, a mystery is something you can't know unless God tells you what it is, unless God reveals it, all right? You don't figure it out. Your mind doesn't nor normally, naturally go in that direction. And, and you won't understand this un un unless God reveals it in a specific way and tells you what it means, okay? We speak God's wisdom, and this God's wisdom has to do with the message of the gospel, okay? And that's the subject here. It's the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. A pagan world just can't get a hold of this. 
pagan world cannot, it doesn't make sense to a pagan world. If God, for, in fact, it doesn't make sense to me in a sense. Can you tell me why God should love a person like me? The hymn writer put that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this? When you, when you stop and you think about this, okay? So, so the pagan world doesn't understand it at all. If they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, and that they did. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, have not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those that love him. For God has revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths or the deeps of God. Now, how, how deep is the um, deepest ocean? I, 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 asked, um, I asked Google about that. And they said seven miles. Yeah. The, the deeps of the ocean go seven miles at, at, at its deepest place. How deep has God buried your sins beyond the deeps? The deeps of God. And, and this salvation that we have is just beyond our comprehension. I challenge preachers, I do it often, and recently I did it, and uh, I challenge preachers to, to study in depth the salvation words of the New Testament. And if you want to do a Bible study that is rich, and that will bless you and excite you and thrill you and really change you from a Baptist to a Pentecostal. Uh, um, study the great salvation words of the New Testament. The deeps of God and, and the wonderful truths that we have. Uh, the, the wisdom of God is unimagined. It is unbelievable. Things have never been before been seen. It's given directly for our glorification never before communicated, never before conceived or considered or imagined. And unsaved people don't have a clue how wonderful this can be in their lives. But until the truth grips your heart, there's a real problem. Did you know that most Christians live in a state of guilt? They're, they're totally aware of how sinful they are and they're intimidated by the fact that they still sin. I did a sermon last Sunday, and I won't do it tonight. We're going to go a different direction tonight uh, on confession of sin. And, and what God does when we confess our sin, and on what basis God does it. When God gets done forgiving our sin, there's nothing left of it. The word forgive means to disconnect or dismiss or send away. And when you confess your sin according to the truth of, 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 of that word forgiveness, remember they had in the Old Testament two goats? You remember that? And David told them they had two goats. And one of the goats was given to cleanse the temple because that's the place where communication with God took place. It cleaned it up to make it possible a clear line of communication between the people and God. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. God's Son, he continually cleanses believers from sin. People are walking in the light and they're being cleansed. This is the norm for the Christian life, the need for confession. But there's a cleansing, which means there's nothing to hinder, no, no impurities that are left when we've confessed our sin, not a single impurity to hinder our communication directly with God. But then there is the forgiveness, and there's that second goat. And what they do, what the high priest did was he took the goat, placed his hand on the goat, which was a transferring of all of the sins of the people to that goat. And that goat was sent out into the wilderness never to come back again. Their sins were totally taken away from them and disconnected from them, never to be discovered anywhere again. And who did it? It was a priest. And what is the function of the priest? I love this. Jesus is our great high priest, right? All right? The function of the priest is to keep his people out of trouble with God. So we should not be living in guilt. 
We should not be intimidated by sin that has been taken care of. And we're going to get into one aspect of how God has taken care of our need for righteousness in our relationship with Him. How do we get good enough? How in the world can God accept us? How in the world can we have free access to God in prayer? How can God take a sinner such like me and give me assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, a foretaste of what? Glory divine. Whom, uh, who, who, whom, whom, he's, whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. God's, God's destiny for us is glorification. Now, how in the world can he do this? See? On what basis can he do this legitimately? Because we all know sin is wrong. And we all know sin is, is, is worthy of judgment. This we know. We all understand that sin is totally unacceptable to God. We know that, correct? Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. So how do we get a standing before God that enables us confidently to enjoy a walk with God in the light of confessing sin continually? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, us with God, and God with us. Fellowship is beyond just talking to God. It's a life partnership. We have a life partnership with God. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, as we are walking in the light. This is strange. We're walking in the light, but now we are continually being cleansed from, from all sin. And I assume that's the sin we hadn't discovered yet, as long as we wanted God out of our lives. Okay? So, how do we get righteous enough? And, and I... Romans 1.16, you know Romans 1.16? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's God's power resulting in divine deliverance and salvation. Resulting in salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and then the Greek, for therein, in this gospel message, the righteousness of God is revealed. That's interesting. The righteousness of God is revealed. So we want to, how do I get that righteousness? All right, let's go through the notes and see if, see if we can find some help and some blessing uh, in this particular subject. We're going to talk about that word uh, accounted that we find in Romans chapter 4 or credited or the old King James says imputed righteousness. Now, there are three important salvation words. Impute, that's the word account or to credit, the word redeem, and the word justify, which normally we think of as forgive. Now, to impute or to account is the positive. To propitiate or redeem is the negative. Now, to impute or to account is to provide righteousness. Okay, it's to provide righteousness. All right, let's look, take, take a look at these, uh, at these uh, uh, Greek lexicons. Briggs and Driver says it means to charge with a financial obligation, to charge to the account of someone. All right, until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not accounted. That, that would be in the King, New King James. The sin is not accounted where there is no law. And uh, Thayer says it means to reckon account, compute, calculate, count over, and it means to pass to one's account. It means to impute to account or to credit. Now, well, let's let's go on, and then with a further explanation, we saw we 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 sang redeemed how I love to proclaim it. What, what does the word redeem mean? All right, in English. Now, there's an idea here in this word redeem. What's the first? This is two syllables, but we'll put it in the same word. What's the first syllable? Re. Re. Okay. What, what does repossess mean? Take back. It means you, you, you take it back and do it again. Re means it is, it's re repeated. It's, it's done, you see. All right? So redeem uh, means that you remove sin by payment for it. Now, you, you, you don't, you can't, if you lose your car to the 
repossession agency, you can't get it back if you don't buy it back. You lost possession of it, you didn't make the payments. But you make the payments and you get it back, but you, you don't get it back without making a payment. There's a payment that's necessary in this redeeming idea, all right? And really, the, the word that we use in our common English today would be the word repurchase. Now the idea is we were all lost to God. We are born dead to God and alive to sin. Is that true? Okay, we're born dead to God, we're born alive to sin. And, and originally it wasn't that way, but, but Adam walked out on God. And he died. The very day he sinned, he died spiritually. He lost his common nature with God. That's why God is foreign to everyone who's not been saved. Someone somewhere, there's nothing personal with God with anyone who's not been saved. So how does God get us back? Through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That's how we're redeemed. We are repurchased. We are bought back. There's a payment of a price to, to, to so God can uh, regain control or ownership of our lives, okay? And that's God's goal in doing this, is divine ownership. <laughs> and I like that because I'm his possession. You take care of what you own. Yes, you get jealous over it. You're not going to take my purse. That's my purse. You're not going to take my billfold. That's my billfold. So we, we are jealous of our own possession. So redeem uh, has to do with rest restoring by payment or repurchase. Uh, there is a former possession which is lost and then it's regained by paying a payment of a price. Okay? So redeem is repurchase. Purchase has the idea of payment. Is that correct? My granddaughter works at Hobby Lobby. They expect payment when you walk out. I joke with the cashier all the time. You know, you meet real people when you joke with them. And so, doesn't matter where I'm at McDonald's or somewhere else, I have to, do I have to pay? <laughs> and it takes them just a moment. I remember one time I was at a McDonald's and, and, and they have all these buttons and these, these, these <coughs> cashiers are all trained to press the right button. And I said, please, uh, 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 I would like some Mac chow mein. <laughs> and, all of them. and then they finally realized there was no match on the wrong menu. So now there's purchase that's involved, and there's payment in there. You don't purchase without payment. So God, we don't. It, salvation is free for us, but boy, did it cost God. Amen. Amen. Okay. So there's redeem, repurchase, if you please. And then there's justification, justification. Now justification is a very interesting thing. Um, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Romans 3 says that God might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. How can God be just and then acquit sinners? Now the word justify means that you go to trial and that nothing is overlooked in the trial. Every charge that can be brought against you for your sin is brought up. Now, the problem is that not only do we realize our sinfulness, but there are sins we commit that we, we don't have enough sense to know we've committed. David said, forgive me for my secret sins in the light of your countenance. Countenance. So, so, these, 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 these sins, everyone has to be accounted for. May I ask you, how many sins did it take to ruin creation? How many sins would it take to ruin heaven? Think about that. How many? A dozen? A thousand? How many sins would it take to ruin heaven? One. How many sins can God let get into heaven? None. But there's none righteous, no, not one. So the problem is, how in the world do we get in? So then we look at the work of the cross. We talked about that this morning. For how many of our sins did Jesus die? 90%. All of them. 
Okay, so now, how much of the payment did he make for that 100% of all our sins? How much of the payment was made? How much of the judgment took place? Why was Calvary such, such a horrific, such a horrible, wrathful display of God against his son? Why was it that way? How many of our sins were on his back? And how much of the judgment did he pay? Okay. How much of the payment was made? And we're talking about the sins that God knows about, not the sins that we know about. Okay. So now, the word justify means you come before the judge and all of the sins are reviewed without exception. Not one is missed because one can't get into heaven. If one sin ever got into heaven, God would cease to be God. The devil would win the whole thing. The whole moral order would collapse. How righteous does God have to be? Okay. How righteous do I have to be to get into heaven? All right, that's the question. So to justify means to put somebody on trial, and when everything is done, the person is acquitted. What is acquittal? Give me the two words. Not guilty. None of the charges can stand. Why can they not stand? Because they have been fully, fully rectified and paid. What does paid in full mean? It used to be, and now we do these things all online, you know, we have these computers. They do all of this work for us. It used to be when you borrowed bank, you the money, you'd go to the banker and you'd ask for money. And the banker would, you'd sign a promissory note, I'm going to borrow $1,000, you sign a promissory note, and, 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 and a certain amount of time, and a certain amount of time, you'll pay the bank back for the funds that you borrowed. And, and, and so, so supposing you go to the bank, you borrow your thousand dollars, and you and six months later you go back with with nine hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents. Doesn't work. You 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 have a bag full of New Guinea seashells. Doesn't work. You don't have dollars anymore. They're Federal Reserve notes. But so you have a thousand dollars in Federal Reserve notes. You give them to the banker. Now what does he do? Well, you don't know anymore because it doesn't work this way. Huh? All right, he, he takes the note out that you signed, puts it on the top of his desk, and he's got a stamp with three words on it, and he stamps that note. What does it say? Paid in full. It says paid in full, all right? Now, if it's really paid in full, you take that home, and most Christians worry all the way home <laughs> that the bank is going to ask them for more money, that God is going to cash in on their sins, don't they? Isn't that way more Christian, what most Christians think? What do you do when you've got this thing? The banker says it's paid. My Bible says your sins are paid in full. Does it not? Yes. If God says they're paid in full, are they paid in full? Yes, yes or no? Yes. And if they're paid in full, then what ought you to do? Worry or shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Should you live in joy and confidence? or worry and terror and fear that your sins are going to catch up with you somewhere. God doesn't sweep our sins under the carpet. If you're as old as I am, if you're as old as I am, you remember a radio program, Fibber McGee and Molly. Yes. <laughs> and everything was sound effects. There was no TV in those days. And, and, and so Fibber McGee and Molly, and Fibber McGee had a closet. And in that closet, he stuffed everything he didn't want people to see. He put all his junk in that closet. But once in a while, he had to go into the closet to get something. And when he went to that closet, there was a terrible roar of junk falling out of the closet. As soon as he opened that door, all of the junk came, came flowing out. Bang, bang, bang. And that was Fibber McGee's closet. And most of us think that God has a closet with all of our sins locked up. Right or wrong? 
right or wrong. That's, that's the way most believers think. God does not sweep. All of our sins went to the cross. That's why it was such a terrible crucifixion day. That's, it was the awfulness of God's wrath. That's how much God hated our sin. That's how unacceptable our sin was to God. That's how unacceptable we were to God because we were literally crucified in Christ on the cross. Okay? God does not want his children living in torment and fear. He does not want that. Justification is acquittal. God accounts for every one of our sins, and the thing is flying out there. He didn't miss a one of them. Okay? So when we stand before the bar of God, according to Colossians, the law of God can't find anything. The law can't condemn us. The devil can't condemn us. Our neighbors can't condemn us. Nobody, nothing but nothing. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's what that means. Justification is acquittal. The case is tried, and there's nothing that's not been totally paid in full. Nothing left to pay. Full acquittal for everyone. Is this helpful? Yes. yes. So, so this is what's going on in our sin. I has not seen. Who in the world could have imagined something like this? The whole problem with this is we do not think in these terms. Our minds don't go there. This is this is this. We we think that God is like us, and the wonderful thing is He's not. He's not. We hold grudges. God's forgiveness doesn't know any grudges. God is not like us. He's like he says he is in his word. And we need to take his word for what it says and rejoice in it. Fanny Crosby wrote that wonderful song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. A foretaste of glory divine. Okay? Now, impute then is an accounting term. Impute is an accounting term. This is the word note. You'll notice two thirds, two -thirds of the way down your page, just below that, that yellow highlight. There's a number three, and then there's a note. All right, take a look at the note. Impute is a term of, a term of accounting. The word account is the same word as impute, okay? It means to put into one's account to put into one's account. Most of us have a bank account. Some people don't, but most people have a bank account. Okay. And how does something get into the account? Well, somebody has to put it in there. Now, you can put it in there, or if the bank will allow, and I would come and put something in there. <coughs> Let me ask you a question now. Supposing I were a rich uncle of yours, and I had a million dollars, and I wanted it in your bank account. And I came to the banker and I said, this is what I want to do. And I processed it legally, and I put a million dollars into your account. The moment it's in your account, who is the owner? Me or you? Me. You are. You own that account. It doesn't matter who put the money in there. The minute it goes in there, it's yours. Imputed righteousness is the righteousness of God to put into your personal account before God, and it is your personal possession. Doesn't make sense. We don't operate this way. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, it hasn't entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those that love him. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we retain full ownership. Now, let's take a look at the bottom of the page here. What, what time do you want to be out here tonight? 10 o'clock, 11, 12? 12? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, let's proceed on. I've still got some time here. The clock is friendly right tonight. I have, I have two definitions for cruel and unusual punishment. 
One is a clock, and the other is a calendar. All right. What kind of righteousness does God require? There are two totally different kinds of righteousness of which we read in the Word of God. Number one is man's own personal righteousness. That's what I produce. That's what comes out. By the way, can you get clean water out of a dirty pipe? And can you get righteous deeds out of a sinful heart? Perfectly righteous deeds out of a sinful heart. Won't happen. Won't happen. All right. So you have man's own personal, but then you have God's righteousness. Okay? And Paul said there's a problem here because some people don't understand God's righteousness is perfect. And they think that, that, that their own imperfect and soiled and sinful righteousness is good enough for God. And Paul said, that won't work. Yeah. All right, Romans 10.1, let's look at it. Look at the second paragraph there on the bottom of the page. Read along in the scripture with me. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel, that's them as Israel, is for their salvation. I testify about them that they have a zeal for God. They're sincere, but not in accordance with knowledge, not in accordance with truth. For not knowing, now these people don't understand, not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. In other words, if you don't have God's righteousness, you don't get into heaven. You can't conjure up a list of do's and don'ts and right things and wrong things and live according to the best you can and get into heaven. It does not work that way. How many sins get into heaven until heaven is not heaven anymore? One. 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 Would you like to be in heaven if sin got in? Same thing would happen to the new heavens and the new earth that happened to the present earth. Correct? It would have the same effect. Okay? Now, three important issues here. There's an ignorance on page two. On page two, I'm on page two. Three important issues. Number one is ignorance of God's righteousness. Secondly, is an effort to make their own personal righteousness the standard of measurement, which is fatal. And number three, an unwillingness to accept and submit to God's standard of perfect righteousness. Question. What is the level of perfection required? How many sins can God per permit to enter into his new heaven and new earth? How many sins did it take to destroy the present creation created order? Now, notice the bullet. Personal righteousness can only be measured in terms of how well we measure up to the law of God. Now this is interesting. Hold that place in your note. This is very, very interesting. If you talk to the average person on the street, you hope to go ahead and go to heaven if you die. All right? The average person would say what? Yeah. Hope so. Hope so. Would like to. Okay? And you say, well, how do you hope to get to heaven? Well, you know, uh, do good to your neighbor, uh, keep the Ten Commandments. Okay, now the problem is this. How in the world can the commandments prove that you belong in heaven when you don't keep them? When you break them, how can a broken law prove that you belong in heaven? Think that one through. That won't work. But officer, I was only going 90 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. I tried to keep the law. You broke it. You don't get away with breaking the law. This is the problem with this whole thing of the thing. Have any of you for one single day kept all of the commandments? And if you haven't, then how in the world can that law, which you've broken and broken and broken and broken, prove to God that you belong in heaven? It can only prove to God you don't belong there and you won't get there. This is why, if, if you think God accepts you because of how good you live, no, 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 none of us live a life apart from the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. None of us, none of us, but none of us earn the favor of God by how we live. We earn the favor of God by accepting Jesus Christ, letting the Spirit of God work the righteousness of Jesus Christ in our life as best we will allow. We don't measure up. We don't have access to God because we had a good day. 
And we're not denied access to God because we've had a bad day. That's not how it works. That's not how, how God thinks. Personal righteousness can only be measured in terms of how well we measure up to the law of God. It is not a matter of how we measure up in comparison to other people or in even in comparison to ourselves. It's, a me it's how we measure up in comparison to God. And look at that Romans text down to verse 24, being justified, that is acquitted freely, that is without charge by his divine favor, by his grace, through the repurchase that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth, God has placed and put him in place as a full payment, propitiation, a full satisfying payment through faith in his blood to declare whose righteousness? His righteousness. I have got to have his righteousness. And if I don't have his righteousness, it won't work. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, whose righteousness? His righteousness, that he might be both just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. Now, how does God view our own personal righteousness? How well do we measure up? And when you get to Romans chapter 1, you have the pagan Gentiles, and you have all of their wickedness. You come to chapter 2, and you have the religious Jews. And the only difference between the, the non-religious pagans and the religious Jews in chapters 1 and 2 are, are, that, are that the pagans are non-religious sinners and the Jews are religious sinners. Look at through carefully. They're all sinners. And he, he draws a conclusion to all of that in, in verse number 10 in, in chapter 3. Take a look at it in your text here, in your notes. Romans 3, 10. As it is written... There are only a few righteous. <laughs> no, no. When God looks at it, there's none righteous. Why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Because if he didn't, nobody but nobody but nobody would make it. There's none right, not one, none who understands, none who sees it. All gone out of the way. Look at the notes there. None that does good, not one. And the, and the Greek text is emphatic. And you'll take a look at the note beneath that, beneath that verse. The contrast with the sinless, perfect life and sacrifice of Christ, who was a lamb without what? Without blemish and without spot. How perfect was the righteousness of Jesus Christ? How perfect was it? How perfect was it? Help me out. It was totally perfect. Sinless. Okay? First Peter 1.18, the second paragraph at the bottom of the page, knowing that you were not repurchased, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and without spot. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now let me give you an illustration, top of page 3. Top of page 3 is that it? This is a powerful, powerful verse. 2 Corinthians 5.20, and I want you to read, if you will, read with me the second paragraph there, which is the New American Standard here. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. All right, now let's put the nouns in for the pronouns, okay? Are you with me in verse 21? Mm -hmm. Read along now. God... Notice the word made Christ, who knew how much sin? No sin. To be sin on our behalf or in our place so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Whose righteousness? Whose righteousness do we get? God's righteousness. Is God's righteousness good enough? Is there any reason it's not acceptable to God? Are there any conditions under which God would not accept his righteousness or the righteousness of his son or the sacrifice of his son? Is there anything, any condition under which God would not do that? All right? Ready for an illustration? Okay. 
Let's say that, let's have a ledger. They don't have ledger books anymore. Anymore. Um, <laughs> there's a new, new translation that says, um, um, consider the lineage of the field. They um, Google not, neither do they Twitter. <laughs> um, that's the new translation. So we, we don't have accounting books generally, the literature <coughs> books, uh, like they used to. You do this, this is with this we do on computers, and, and, and you hold, you get your account from the bank, and mine balances out right all the time. They never make a mistake, just almost never. And, but it's all done with these computers, okay? But let's say, let's go back to the old-fashioned way of bookkeeping, all right? And we're gonna have a ledger book, all right? And we're gonna have two pages. We're gonna have a page on this side, and, and, uh, and then we're going to have a page on this side. And on this side, on this side, which is on, let's see, let's take, let's take the right side. So you don't get you all mixed up. Let's say the right side here, at the top of the page is the name Jesus Christ. All right? And it's an accounting of everything that he ever did or said in his life. And everything on that list is good and perfect and sinless and right. Totally righteous. Okay. But on the left side, let's put my name or let's put your name. This is an accounting of our life. Every deed we've ever done and every thought we've ever thought, everything we've ever said or anticipated, everything we, anything we've ever contemplated, and the only thing we can say is, oh me, oh my, oh, I don't want to look at that. So we have, we have an accounting of our life on the left page, an accounting of the life of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now according to this verse, there's an exchange that takes place. Jesus Christ was made sin in our place, in our behalf. That means the exchange was this. God took everything, and by the way, on this, this, on this accounting of your life, it's from the moment of conception until you check out. Everything is on that page. Nothing is omitted. Now, everything on that page is transferred under the account, under, under the account of Jesus Christ. And he goes to the cross. And God the Father requires of him judgment and payment and punishment and justice for everything that's on that list. But it doesn't stop there. All of the good and righteous deeds that are on his account are transferred and put on our account. And that's called accounted, credited, imputed righteousness. Placed on our account. God made Jesus Christ to be sin. He wasn't sin. Who knew no sin. In the text, Greek text, God, God, the one who knew no sin was made sin. The emphasis is on his sinlessness. The one who knew no sin was made sin in our place, on our behalf, in order that we might become what we were not. In order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay? So Jesus Christ was made what he was not so that we might become what we are not. And this is, this is acceptable to God because this is what he did. This is what he intended to be his provision for us. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, hear me, we not only receive him as, in his person, we receive all of his righteousness at the same time. You think that's true? Are you ready for a hallelujah moment? Okay. When we receive Christ, we receive his life, we receive his righteousness. His life is eternal. How do you, if you don't have Christ, you don't have life, John said. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I've written these things to you who have believed on the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. 
and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. When we receive him, we get everything that he is. Yes or no? Yes. We don't get what part of what he is. We get everything of what he is. Okay? So, the grace of God provides this. What does the word grace mean? That's another great salvation word. It means, it means divine favor. And always, it's undeserved, totally unmerited and undeserved. Notice three things about the grace of God in your notes. Number one is unmerited. You can never deserve it. Number two, it's unearned. You can't earn it. No, there is no amount of works that can bring God divine favor to you. Divine favor is given through Jesus Christ. That's why there's no other way. There's no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. He's the only one who provides what God requires. Nothing else or no one else does. And the grace of God is inexhaustible. Study it. You can't wear it out and you can't run out of the favor of God. It doesn't matter who you are and what you do. Now my last thing is this. I'm an Innis by birth. I didn't become an Innis by trying and striving and working to become an Innis. I was born into the family. Okay? My last name is Innis. Now, I am therefore in direct personal relationship with my mother and my father and my family because I'm birthed into that relationship. It is not a works relationship. It is a birth relationship that can never be, never be changed. It doesn't matter if I rob banks and I kill and I murder and do drugs. I still have my dad's and mom's life in me. Now, I can never lose my life relationship with my parents, but I can lose my fellowship with my parents. Okay? I can get out of sorts with my parents. And it's a tragedy when we, as believers, let sin pile up in our lives, but we are still believers. So, the grace of God always is without limit. There's no cap on it. And if there was, none of us would be here tonight. Yes or no? Yes. There's no cap on it. It's unlimited. Eye has not seen, ear has heard, not heard. It, it, it hasn't occurred to man in his wild imagination that God would have a provision like this for believers. Right or wrong? And most believers don't get it. But God has revealed this to us by His Spirit. Because His Spirit searches the deeps of God. Isn't it wonderful that God doesn't think like we do? Yeah. And that God isn't shallow like we are. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Okay. So, He goes and He talks about and notice the little heading above Romans 4, 1, confidence in the law and works that his personal efforts are one and the same thing. Can these save us, or is it faith that is confidence in the supernatural works of a supernatural God? How is it that we have salvation, you see, through the law or by faith in Jesus Christ? The law can't do what Jesus Christ did because it depends on what I do, and I can't do what I need to do. And, and so he talks about Abraham, who is, who is a, a tremendous example. And, and there's a real issue. Let's, let's read verses 1 and 2 here. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to profession, profession, found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he is something to what? Boast, Boast about and brag about. And God is not going to have this. God will not have this. God was going to get all of the glory but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited. The New King James says, accounted to him. As what? Righteousness. Righteousness. A credit means to put, it was put into his account. 
It became his possession. Whose righteousness was it? God's righteousness. It wasn't righteousness of the law or the righteousness of works. It was God's righteousness. Down to verse 10, on what basis? How then was it credited? Or whether he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Well, this all happened before circumcision ever came on the scene. Circumcision became a seal or a sign of this righteousness that he had by faith, but it was his before that ever happened. And you'll notice 13, the promise to Abraham and to his descendants was not through the law, through the righteousness that comes by faith, saving faith. Those who are of the law are heirs. Faith is made void. The promise is nullified. Notice the, 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 the emphasis on the promise, the promise, the promise of God. Now, let, let's go to the promise of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord might be saved. Shall, shall be saved. Shall be saved. Being therefore justified by faith. All of these things are based on a promise, an unchangeable, eternal commitment that God has made in his word. Now, if God says you are forgiven, are you forgiven? Yes. What if you don't feel like it? <laughs> How many times have you confessed your sin and the devil said to you, you're not forgiven? It's not that easy. So you confessed again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. That means 90% of the time he'll follow through. He's faithful 100% of the time. And he's righteous. He's right to do it. He would be wrong to deny you forgiveness because he'd be denying what Jesus did for you on the cross. Can God do that? Can God do that? God cannot do that. He's faithful and he's just. So you have the emphasis on the promise of God and the confidence and assurance. In verse 23 at the bottom of the page, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. You have on page four the problem, the problem, the problem of seeking to attain this right the standard of righteousness by works. Go to down to verse ten and on page four, verse ten: Cursed is everyone who does not continue in everything in all things that are written in the book of law to do them. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God, but just shall live by faith. Notice the note at the bottom of that, the scripture text. The law is here is totally disconnected from Abraham's faith. His confidence was not in the law of God, but in God's messianic offspring and his work of salvation through the supernatural work of God. The note under there, it is only in the perfect keeping of the law that a person can attain righteousness. A law that is broken to him can never make a person righteous. Now, do you have Jesus Christ? If you do, you have imputed righteousness. You have his righteousness credited by faith to your and I have bulleted here, follow this down with me. Profound and blessed results that come from embracing this amazing and wonderful truth. The absolute, notice the word absolute assurance of the forgiveness of sins. The absolute assurance of eternal life. Going to heaven when you die. The absolute assurance that God is on our side. Bold and free access to God in prayer and the throne of grace at the end of a bad day as well as the end of a good day. Confidence and joy in our walk with God. Does God want us to enjoy him? Does he want to be an ogre or a blessed father to us? What is his desire? 
an absolute confidence and assurance that God will work everything in our lives to our good and to his glory. What a God. And what a salvation. Credited righteousness. An exchange of accounts. Our sins are on his account. And his righteousness is on our account. And the righteousness on our account is God's righteousness. God cannot, cannot refuse or deny. Find hymn number 339. 339. Can you find it for me? Just give me the. Uh,